as a young guy, it's all about a captain who can make you feel part of the team, make you, you know, cares about you, leads you. And then when you move up in, in rank to chief mate and you have responsibilities, the best captains are the real ones who support you, but are also very technically competent. The idea behind G Captain, how long does it take before you start it? after having the idea. No, so we went down and we were like, shipping's a terrible idea. No one's interested in shipping. It's, <laughs> you know, we, we went and talked to all these people and they were like, no, I mean, they had no interest in shipping. I really want to talk about the process you had when you wrote the book, because you said that writing this book was the most painful experience in your life. So uh, you, you really, you've done your homework. You can get to these emotional moments of <laughs> your life. I'm super excited to be joined by John. And John, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. I, I love your your uh, your show. I've been a huge fan, and as you know, and watching all the episodes. And uh, you had my friend Dr. Sal Macagiano last. Uh, I enjoyed that. No, it's a pleasure having you on. It's actually a big honor. But uh, can we just go? all the way back, if you just start at your upbringing, what was sort of the influence growing up? Did you have any hobbies or beliefs or principles that led you towards the ocean? Or was it just like a discovery process and how you ended up creating a career in the ocean? Yeah, well, it's not a simple and easy story. It uh, was complicated and a little bit difficult. I grew up um, in the Bronx and back in the Bronx was probably one of the most dangerous places on earth in the late seventies, early eighties. My dad was a fireman and sort of the special forces of the fire, which is rescue three. They only went to the big fires and the big problems. And, um, you know, the Bronx was burning. He was averaging three major, we're talking buildings fully engulfed with people jumping out windows, uh, you know, a night, the whole, the whole Bronx burned. And that was because they took the port, out of New York City, Manhattan, and they sent it over to New Jersey, and that sucked the the tax dollar off. And the factories, of course, went as well. We had huge factories in the up till the seventies in New York City. So there, there was just no money for services and everything else. And the Bronx started burning. Um, so that was my childhood. Uh, then my dad moved us to sort of the uh, to to uh, one of the nice. He, he looked for the district, the suburb with the best school district, but the oldest, most dilapidated house in the best school district of the super rich suburbs. So I went from, you know, one of the worst areas and to one of the richest and, and they had the yacht club there and I really wanted to sail. I'd ride my bike down, but we had no money. Dad being a fireman, mom a nurse. Um, even though my dad had gone to Columbia uh, for, uh, for for meta, medicine and uh, you know one of the Ivy League schools, he he still wanted to be a fireman to help out this problem. So I I, I would go down to the yacht club. The gates barred. You can't enter. I really wanted to sail. I, I bugged them for years, and finally my dad kind of knocked on the door. The yacht club. It said, "Who's the best sailor?" Found out who the best sailor was. This guy Rich Demolin asked Rich uh, if he could teach me how to sail, and um, Rich brought me on. He's a uh, he he sailed with Ted Turner in the America's Cup. He was Ted Turner's navigator, and he owned a big. He was CEO of a big shipping company, uh, Marine Transport Lines, which was later bought out by Crowley. He still owns a, a number of bulkers, but uh, he he brought me on board and taught me how to sail. Um, and then I went to the U, U.S. Naval Academy, um, and unfortunately, my dad got cancer. Uh, because he was a medic in Vietnam with Agent Orange. So I had to transfer home to be closer. My little brother was only 12. And that's when I went to the Merchant Marine Academy in New York. New York Maritime Academy uh, allowed me to be a little closer to home. I still wanted to go in the Navy. Uh, I wanted to fly. I was actually from watching Top Gun as a kid. I was like, ah, well, this is what I want to do. But then I found, I got on the ship and I found, wow, these are the biggest objects built by man that are movable that you can pilot you could drive and i just fell in love with the idea of uh becoming a ship captain uh 
but I was also a computer nerd in college. And that's, it was ship cam computer nerd, but my, um, my guidance counselor was like, this is late nineties, mid nineties. He said, there's no future in computers, John do the ship things. <laughs> uh, but the advantage to that is I, I got on board the drill ships. Drill ships are very, you know, up to billion dollar rigs that are all computer controlled, all networked, all. So, you know, after a few years of sailing, you know, first product tankers and super tankers up to Valdez, I, I got pulled into the drill ship world. Interesting. I mean, there's so many things there I would love to, to talk a about. A lot there. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot there, but it's a perfect summary, I guess. So just take us back to sort of the, the first jobs out on the sea. Is it Alaska tanker? How early was that starting point? Was that some, some of the first jobs you did, sailing the tankers up and down the coast? My first was a product tanker. Uh, we have what's called the Jones Act in the United States. So that says that it's a ship going only between U.S. ports has to be U.S. flagged but and has to be built and crewed by Americans, but it's extremely expensive to build a new ship. It's four to five times the cost of building in say Korea. So no one builds new ships here. So the American fleet is really old down, run down. Um, but it gave me the opportunity, this old rust bucket of a product tanker running between Houston and New York and Boston and back with the old valves. And you had a chalkboard where you had to, gauge with the, uh, with the tape. And uh, we did have IG system. And it, it's funny because everything's relative. When I got off, my relief came on. And there were only two states in the US that allow non-IG, so where you don't have to reclaim your gas, you know, open ologing. And um, he was on one of those that I was telling him, oh, we got the tape and we got the chalkboard and we do things the old school. He's like, you got an IG system, you got a gas system. This is great. Like he was so excited to be on a modern ship. Meanwhile, you know, the international fleet by then or 2000 had really gone to digital uh, ologing and, you know, push button controls from the control room. So everything's relative, right? Definitely. In all those different experiences, where do you feel like you had the steepest learning curve? That was probably it. The first one, you know, you just brand new on, uh, you know, and, and the pollution laws are crazy in the U.S. So you have to be extremely careful of, of what you're doing. Right. Um, but I've always been very, I guess, willing to ask questions to get the captain involved. Uh, so my pulling into Baytown, I remember the first time in Houston, you know, you had this huge refinery that it just goes on for acres and you get a big pipe connected to the ship in your header. And they tell you, if anything goes wrong, here's the big shutdown button. And on the, on the top of a tanker, you have two lights. You have a, um, a yellow light and a red light. And when the, when the tank gets pressed up, when it gets to like 10%, the yellow light goes off and you get a little alarm. And then when it gets to 5%, the red light gets, goes on. And then you got the big sirens and the, and the ship's horn starts to warn everyone, like you're about to have <laughs> the oil spill. So the chief made hands off to me, my very first watch. I'm standing there. I'm all nervous. You got the APs. You're watching these tank levels and the chief mate goes, well, before you, right after you start, you're supposed to test these alarms, but he never told me. So he goes in. And to test these alarms, he turns on the yellow and he turns on the red and suddenly they're going, woo, woo. And I get nervous. So they told me to press the button. So I jam the button and suddenly all these huge pumps in the refinery turn off like immediately. And you just see this big, big pipeline. It just goes like a wave and, a whoo, and you hear the, the steel of the thing cranking as this thing goes by and seizes and there are people running down and you got the... Coast Guard coming. And so that, that was my first cargo watch. Um, so it, it, it was a very steep learning curve. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, so some of the things that I'm fascinating about learning more about is these, the differences between being sort of a, an employee on land versus, you know, being out there in the oceans because the hierarchy is so different, right? Because once you're in the vessel, like, 
there are very strict sort of social orders and rules, right? So how would you describe sort of the social hierarchy on a vessel and what is the, the pros of that process versus the cons? Because we all see in some of documentaries where you see sort of what can go wrong once you don't feel like you have sort of the the right position to 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 sort of say against you know the captain's orders right because there is a very strong hierarchy on board ships right so it's it's changed dramatically when i you know was first on that oil tanker it was six dollar a minute phone calls and um no internet no anything you know you had a tv lounge with a hundred VHS tapes. And then you had a library and uh, the crew all ate together. And then they went and they socialized together. You'd watch a movie or uh, you spent a lot of time together. And when you, you're off time, you go up to the bridge and just hang out and, and talk. Um, then I went on the drill ships. Uh, so there's a billion dollar ships that had fairly high speed internet and you could connect with home. And now it's like, wow, this is completely different because I used to, used to go out for months at a time and at $6 a minute, your family would only call if something, you know, someone had died or got sick or something bad. So you were always kind of fearful of that phone call, but then you had the whole crew to, to go around you. But suddenly here on the drill ship, you got, you know, texting, you got, internet, you got everything else. And then when people are done work, they're going into their cabin, they're playing video games or on their devices. Uh, and also, you know, we had meetings with the short twice a day. So you'd have these Skype meetings and it's not just, you know, suddenly you're answering for sure. And they don't understand the difficulties that you have on board ship. They're always asking you to do things. So it's, it's changed dramatically, but um, you know, better connection to your family, but also I was always more in the compartmentalized when I'm out at sea, I, I, it made me too sad to think of my family and being away. Uh, so I, I didn't connect very well. And when I'm home, I'm very present. I didn't connect. Some guys continuously connect with the ship and bring some manuals to work on or something. Oh my, I didn't, I, I really segmented those lives. But then once you have this internet and technology, you're pulled into all the problems. Your son, you know, failed this test grade or your, your, your nephew got in a car accident. He's okay, but he's in the hospital, these things. Um, so it's led to, you know, a real, a lot of stress on mariners now where it used to be guys went out to sea to get away from all of this, right? And that's part of the reason I was able to jump up so high because I knew these computers where most people went to sea because they were they wanted to get away from the technology. But now it's inescapable. Definitely. Talking a bit about leadership and yourself being a captain, what do you think separates a good captain from, or separates a great captain from a good captain on board? Well, it's interesting. I thought about this a lot because I was lucky my first six captains were Excellent. <laughs> I mean, the, the absolute best captains. And then the next captain I had, he got his license in a way that wasn't legal and he was attacked by pirates. Um, and, and part of the reason he was attacked by pirates was because he treated his crew so bad. The crew kind of let the pirates on off Nigeria. But then the, the company kind of to reward him <laughs> for this pirate put him in charge, even though he didn't have an unlimited license, he was used to smaller ships. Uh, they arranged for him to get a flag of convenience, unlimited and be captain. So we went from a very small ship to the captain of this big, expensive, multi, you know, uh, billion dollar operation. And then he was just absolutely horrible. Um, and then uh, captains afterwards, some were really good, some were bad. But what I realized looking back is those initial captains, you know, some of them had issues, um, but you're so new, you don't realize their faults and deficiencies. So as a young guy, it's all about a captain who can make you feel part of the team, make you, you know, cares about you, leads you. And then when you move up in, in rank to chief mate and you have responsibilities, the best captains are the real ones who support you but are also very technically competent. That you can go to them with problems and hopefully they will know more than you do. But that's 
not the case. So you're kind of almost ignorance is bliss as a young cadet coming out and you just want someone who's going to keep you safe and, you know, keep an eye out for you and help you with your job. But as ships get more difficult or, you know, there are more technical issues, you really want someone who's got that leadership abilities can connect with the crew, motivate the crew and has that technical expertise. And I found the guys who are nice and have, if you listen real well, if you listen to your crew, if you're engaged in what they're doing, especially on the larger ships like drill ships, I really struggled until I got interested. Uh, on the tankers, I got I struggled until I was interested in engineering. You know, there was always this friction with the engine room. And then one day I said, man, these engines are huge. Let me go down. And, the, and it was like the scene of Fight Club, like, go away. We don't want you. But as you show interest, you get excited and you learn about it. They, teach you new things and your expertise goes up and then you, you get the engine room and suddenly you can do things you can't. And I had to relearn that on drill ships. Hey, teach me about this at drilling. We're too busy to teach. Well, I'm going to sit here and learn anyway um, during my off time. So being able to listen, empathize, stand up for your guys. And really that, that technical knowledge is important. That's a great, great summary. Uh, I found a quote that you also ha have mentioned before, but I just want to read it out loud because I felt it was super good that the sea is selective, slow at recognition of effort and aptitude, but fast in sinking of the unfit. Is that sort of the yes. perfect quote from Felix Riesenberg talking about sort of the oceans and how, yeah, basically just summarizing how you need to, or how the oceans treat you if you're not suited for it, basically. Right. And that that's... That quote is engraved in uh, the marble of Fort Schuyler or New York Maritime College, where I went to school. And you have to memorize it when you get there. But Captain Felix Reisenberg was really interesting. He was like, you know, I don't know who the popular um, authors are now, uh, you know, but Robert Peterson or Clive Klusser, he was that a hundred years ago, but he was also a captain but extremely popular, but, you know, the, the, the average public loves sea stories. You had Felix Ryan, Conrad, you had Kim more famous, but the, there was a real desire for this literature. Um, and it's mostly been forgotten. We had to memorize that quote, but we were never told to read any of his books in college. Uh, it's actually Sal Mercagliano who's going to read one of his books. I'm like, this is, this is a really great, Book, but that quote uh, is important because um, I said that a good leader also has to have that knowledge, and I think we're focused a lot on you have all these books, happiness and leadership that are really on the soft side, but they're not really focused on the deep technical knowledge. Other thing is, you know, a lot of people specialize now, so. The closest calls in my career have all been from a cat drill ship who had never been on a tanker, never been on a container ship, never been. You know, you don't go in an anchor very much. So when they did, they were in trouble, you know. So kind of, you know, learning a diversity of skills is important. And that's what Felix Reisenberg is saying. If, if you don't have that technical competence, if you don't at least have the learning in these different areas, you're going to see a situation that's you're going to get in trouble and that the ocean doesn't care, right? It doesn't care if you live or die. It's completely apathetic. What's, what's the opposite of love? People think it's hate. It's not, it's apathy. The, if you, if a, if a woman hates you, you can almost turn that into love. Uh, you know, if, if you pursue her and you're nice and you're kind but if she wants nothing to do with you, you're on your own, right? And that's, I think the lesson of Felix Reisenberg is the, the, the ocean is beautiful and majestic that we think it's there to help us, but it's, it's really completely apathetic. It's, it's, it's going to challenge you at the worst times. And if you don't have that knowledge, it will, it will, it will kill you, right? But, but the next subject I want to take up was the the idea of G-Captain, what was the idea behind it? Because 
you was you talked a bit about your interest in computer science, but I guess it's also fair to say that you had an interest in entrepreneurship, new things going on, because there's also a great story of how you sort of was a an early social influencer on a Kevin Rose network. So you obviously had several interests, right? So how did this all end up when you started to start your own companies? Well, if we go back a little bit, um, I got pulled into the drill ship world, which is, you know, phenomenally different from the, you know, just basic tankers. And um, I got pulled into India. Uh, there was these brothers, the Ambani brothers, uh, Mukesh and Anil had um, poured all of their family money into building this refinery, which everyone said would be absolutely impossible because in India, there's just huge layers of bureaucracy. You know, if you think the U.S. or Europe is bad, it's built something like a refinery is impossible in India, but they did it. They did it. And then, but they didn't have anything to put into the refinery, <laughs> oil and natural gas. So they hired this drill ship, uh, but they hired an old one because they couldn't afford it. They only had six months runway. They literally put all the money they had into getting this drill ship over and the computer systems didn't work. So they hired me to, to go uh, you know, on this drill ship. And um, they promoted me even before I had my license to chief mate. And then uh, we found four trillion cubic feet of natural gas. It was the biggest find in the world. It was a Guinness Book of World Record. So they were extremely happy. And now when you land in Mumbai, uh, the biggest skyscraper is theirs. And it's not Reliance's office. It's their private mansion. That's where they, the family lives, the skyscraper. That's how wealthy. Uh, but but they told me like, oh, if we were American, we'd move to Silicon Valley. This is, this is entrepreneurship. So I was really inspired by their story. And, you know, a lot of the tech companies now in America are, are run by, by Indians. They've really taken over the sea level thing. So I got some introductions and I went there. And also, you remember, I had one of the very few ships with the Internet uh, being on this drill ship. So I was in the middle of Mumbai. There are long periods that you had nothing to do, but uh, it, the Internet was slow. So Kevin Rose came out with the first social media network. Uh, before Facebook or anything else, and you could vote up news stories. So I could go there and I could, these are the top 10 stories. I click on the New York Times, it would take a while to load instead of browsing through headlines. It was voted. So during my off time, I started helping him post stories because I was so appreciative when I was on the ship of this thing. And, uh, you know, he invited me in. We were called, uh, we weren't influencers, uh, power users. I think they called us, I forget. <laughs> and he was like, oh, the power users provide over 90% of the uh, content. It's the Pareto principle, you know, that 10% of the people provide 90% of the content. So I, I thought, you know, there may be a dozens of us, but there were, there were three of us, right? The three <laughs> super users were doing most of the content for the site. Um, but he kind of convinced me to, to start our ski network. And then I became very good friends with the chief operating officer of Facebook and some of the Twitter guys and that. Um, so I got involved and, you know, there were, I already thought I missed the, the blogging window because there's so many great blogs at the time. Um, but, you know, this was back when you had to get a server and, and go to Austin, put the server in the rack and, and compute it. Now you could just hit a WordPress site and you've got a new site. Um, but that's that's sort of how we got started. Interesting. So the idea behind G Captain, how long does it take before you start it after having the idea? Was it like you instantaneously knew that okay, I'm just gonna start G Captain, or did you have a long thought process about okay? What's going to be the niche, the target group, how I'm going to build it? Or was it just like, let's just start and just build it from there and bootstrap it? No. So we went down and we were like, shipping is a terrible idea. No one's interested in shipping. It's, <laughs> you know, we, we went and talked to all these people and they were like, no, I mean, they had no interest in shipping um, because shipping has kind of been blind. Like I said, my childhood, 
the ships used to be in Manhattan, right? Everyone saw them and then they got moved to Newark and San, they were in San Francisco and then they got to Oakland. So my generation hasn't seen ships and we're very disconnected in America from shipping. We have this problem called sea blindness. So, I mean, they had, I can't even tell you how little interest. Plus there's this negative connotation because we had the Exxon Valdez spill in uh, 1990. So not only, but they think it's dirty and ugly, you know, so a lot of these venture capitalists Remember the Exxon Valdez, that's their pinpoint. And they, they invest a lot of money in farm to table clamming and whale research and everything else, but they really had a bad taste about shipping. So it was a, it was a hard no. Um, but then we started uh, ski websites um, and that we, we thought each of these mountains, you have the official website of the mountain and um, then you had a, another website that kind of tried to sell you condos and vacation homes, <laughs> hotels, but wasn't real news. I said, we, we, want a, we want a site for the skiers, like, but very specific. So we started building these websites for each individual ski resort, and we raised $6 million, just a flood of venture capital money. And suddenly we, we were doing movies and we we're flying to all the continents. We had Olympic skiers on our team. It was, it was, it was pretty insane and, and connected in with some of the biggest blogs and news sites at the time, uh, the Gawkers, the Gizmodos. Uh, we were doing partnership and heliskis and we, we did a movie. Uh, I was telling you offline, you know, these, these pit viper glasses here. You know, it was started by Chuck Mumford, who was one of our first pro skiers, and we did the movie NAR, and he he was the star of it, and then went to do this. So it was a lot of money. It was like early Chris Saka, who's um, one of the most famous investors. He's Shark Tank, one of the original Shark Tank. He was he was living right by the ski, so he made a lot of introductions, and it was easy. But then you know the, the snow melts in the summer, and I was like. Well, we already have the server. I've already installed it. I've already coded it. I've already done all this work. You know, let me let me try a maritime news site, G Captain. And no one read it at first, but this big bulk ship ran aground in Australia. And the news sites, New York Times, and Wall Street Journal, and the Financial Times, they used to all have a doc reporter, but they got rid of them in the early 2000s because they were so expensive. And they went to young journalist guys who were, you know, generalists, not, not specialists. Um, so they've started to really get the maritime stories wrong, which they still do a lot. Um, but we wanted to, like, here's the captain's perspective. You know, you got the union saying one thing, the, the country saying another, the Coast Guard saying another, the cargo owner saying another. No one was saying what the captain thought. So that's that's what I really wanted to do was kind of bring the captain's perspective to maritime news. Um, How long did it take before you, you started to get the traction that you felt like, okay, now let's build a company? Because as you said, you know, so many people have this, have this idea that if I just build something good, people will come. But then as soon as you start building something and you feel like, okay, this is pretty good, you start to notice that, okay, but people aren't waking up a day searching for a new newspaper. You have to sort of force it to be as good that you create this a momentum, right? So it's interesting that you say that, you know, I think this was a, so a point that Sal also mentioned in, in the previous podcast that sort of like you get this big accident or big, like suddenly all eyes are on a subject and then you manage to create momentum through now you have the world lenses, right? So how is it to sort of go through that stage where you build and build, but people aren't coming initially, and then you have to sort of, you know, f try to create a momentum and be stubborn and just keep on building? It's difficult. No one, no one's reading it, but my mom and my wife, and my my wife's sick of hearing about it. And we talked to, about it earlier. Like I, I was, I was, you know, um, on on the drill ship at first work and chief mate. And then later I went to be captain and build the billion dollar drill ship for BB. So I'm doing that. My, my brand new son was born. I got it in my head that I needed to get an MBA and I was very close. I only had like six credits left. And then I was running on official networks and I was running and I was trying to launch G captain. And my wife's like, you got to quit something. So I quit the MBA and everyone's still like, I still only have six credits left. This was 15 years ago. Like everyone's like, you should go back. But what's the point? I got the lessons for it, but 
do I really need the degree? And I, there was also a fear that if I got the degree, the, the salaries are so great in the maritime industry. If you got a captain's license and an MBA, I thought I'd be stuck at a desk job. You know, it was also, I, I, I got a pilot job very early down, early on offer in um, LA and I turned it down because I was like, I just can't, the money's phenomenal, but I can't see myself, especially in LA where there isn't many channels or rivers or thing, just getting on the ship and doing the same thing over and over again. So uh, I, you know, I quit my MBA and I kind of put up these barriers to prevent myself from doing that. But it, it goes back to, I think being stubborn. Uh, you know, I, I'm not very coordinated. I don't have hands, but I wanted to get in the Naval Academy, and it takes extremely good grades and extreme well-roundedness. You need to be captain of certain clubs, and you need varsity letters. And I was like, I can't do all this, but I can. I can run and not stop and just deal with the pain. So I got eight varsity letters, you know, it was a record in my school for track. And I never won one competition because in these cross country races, you got like 300 people. But so I think that's what startup is, is like you got all these temptations. And if you're in a wealthy country and a lot of, especially in Silicon Valley, I mean, I joke, I should have stayed with the ski. My brother runs it. He still runs it. But, you know, I think it was the stubbornness and also seeing like this kinship of the seafarers, they need this information on the disasters to prevent injury, like to prevent, we need to pull the uh, the industry up. We need to promote startups. We need to do all this stuff. Um, so, and when all the venture capitalists and shipping companies said no, you know, I, I mean, I just raised $6 million. This is easy. Got my captain. I'm a young captain, one of the youngest in my class, and, and all this is going well. And then I start this, and it was it was trouble. It was nothing but hard work and trouble. And I was like, but it was also a challenge, right? I wanna. So you got to be able to post continuously, and then you get to that point of like opportunity costs. Like, do I do I throw in the towel? <laughs> and then you you get the thing like it's darkest right before you're successful, right? That's the. But the thing is, you're it's darkest, and then you get a spurt of success. Like the Pasha Volker was like, woohoo, like we got a thousand people reading this article. Like it was huge. Now, now a big article is like over a million reads for us. <laughs> but, but you're like, man, a thousand, this is great. And it just carries you on enough till the next, till you want to give up again. Right. Fast forward. And, and expertise, right? You have to do something that you're, you know, the ski, I was never a good skier, never really into skiing. So it was hard for me to show up to work every day. And I enjoyed it. I loved the scene, but I'd have to spend hours at night trying to figure out what people were talking about, writing down acronyms and learning about ski resorts. It wasn't like natural pole where the ships were. How do you envision the future for G-Captain? Do you have a grand vision or do you plan just year by year? Or do you have like an, a North Star you always want to follow and you want to reach? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, our, our, our North Star has always been to, to provide this, you know, the best quality news uh, to the captains for low cost. Back then, you know, all the magazines that were good quality news cost money. There were some free ones, but they were mostly press releases. So we're always trying to improve the quality and, and improve our reach. You know, people ask, why don't you do a print magazine? I would love to do a print magazine. You know, I don't care if our articles get are distributed on, on the covers of toilet paper. I, I don't, you know, the distribution doesn't matter. The fact it is distributed matters. And the fact that the news is quality matters. Um, so other people are posting, you know, now, now, like I said, it's easy to create a, a news website uh, and we have a lot of competition that's free now, but we want to, we want to provide the, the, we're not necessarily the first, we're not, but we want to be quality news. So, um, and, and you think the shipping industry has been, that's the other thing in 2008, we almost lost the business. Everything collapsed. We lost every advertiser in a period of week. And now it's only like we're only starting to be <laughs> really profitable again now that shipping is making some serious money. So, um, you know, we, we, we were doing planning a lot of new ideas as well, too. But uh, we're also looking, you know, we always want to promote people like you or, or 
at the at the crux of uh, the industry and learning new things. And you know, there, there's a lot more work than just you can can do. We we need people like you. We need people like Stan. We need ship owners who are writing and participating. And uh, we we need to open up this industry. I couldn't agree more. Just talking about when once we're talking about quality writing, and I also you know I really want to talk about the process you had when you wrote the book, because you said that writing this book was the most painful experience in your life. So we need to spend some minutes on that. So I think it's just fascinating to to hear again, the uh, initial idea and how you went about writing this story that is well known, but I, I will let you introduce it because you will introduce the best uh, you, you really, you've done your homework. You can get to these emotional moments of <laughs> your life. Um, I, I worked for Transocean. I had been um, on board. I had been offered the, the job, uh, the camp job on the Deepwater Horizon. My, my buddy, uh, Kurt, was the captain. And one of my best friends uh, on, on the rig that exploded was Chief Mate Dave Young, who was one of my best friends in college. I had gotten him the job at Transocean. Um, so, and, but then we, we had five fires on, on my ship. Um, and I, 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 I blew the whistle. I called the Coast Guard. I told them I, I did everything I can to, so this is, this is not going to end well. And I was blackballed from the industry. I was, I was uh, fired from the company. Uh, they sent out a letter to, to all the employees kind of suggesting that I had caused some of these fires. Um, it, it was a really difficult moment, um, in my life. Um, and then I started really researching these fires and the thing, and because I was really afraid something big would happen, and it's it did it exploded. But because I had been there, I had this news website, I had the connections, and then it was just a media flood. So NPR, Bloomberg, everyone else went and they tried to talk to this crew, and the second mate of the ship actually gave one interview, and they misquoted her. You know, to kind of get this salacious headline, and it caused the crew to say, "We're not doing this again." So it, it started just blog posts, and I told the captain. I, I actually gave him the administrative password of G Captain. I said, "If there's anything you don't like, here's the button you can crash the website and delete everything." My whole business will be gone. Um, but I want to get the story out there because I think it's important. I'm going to help save lives. So I was the only news outlet in the world who had access to these guys. I also had access to the Coast Guard. I had guys in the company and BP who knew I quit. Not, not my company, but other companies who were feeding me <laughs> info. Um, so, uh, and then New York Times and everyone else came to me and they were asking me at the trial to help them with the story. Uh, so the, the head investigative reporter at NPR was like, I want you to write a book. I said, okay, but I'm not a great writer. He said, we could find you someone. So we found the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post magazine, Tom Schroeder. And it was like a master's degree. I'd write these horrible chapters and then he'd clean it up and tell me what I had to rewrite, right? So it was, um, that was the story. But I'm doing these interviews with a crew who lost, you know, people died. And it was, it's emotionally difficult process, but I felt important. Definitely. Just going through that project and writing about it such in depth and talking to the crew, what do you think are the biggest lessons you, you sit with afterwards, after ending such a project and sort of gathering everything and writing it, releasing it and sort of reflecting on it? What do you think are the biggest lessons you, you sit back with? Well, I don't know if you, I think you have been on Twitter and I'm, you know, we're, we're finally, we're finally the the uh, market share of, I, we're finally profitable and all our profit comes from commercial. Uh, but we had this huge network of think tanks and war colleges and around the world, every Ivy League school, like Princeton, Harvard, have these buildings that are devoted to like naval and military science, right? But not one of them has a, and, and we're learning from Russia that, you know, we knew before her, but generals win battles. Logistics wins wars, <laughs> and 
you know, I've added another one, sea lift, the movement of on the oceans, because 90% of everything goes in the ocean. That, that's what wins empires. And we've forgotten about that. So in all of these think tanks, there, there's no ship captain at the Pentagon, commercial ship captain. They're Navy captains. They're not a Princeton. They're not. So we have billions of dollars being spent on these naval tactics, but none on commercial. And the ships are now encountering mines, they're encountering um, uh, you know, China is ramping up tensions. They just said countries we don't like can't go through the Taiwan Strait, and they have a hundred more Navy ships than the U.S. Navy. I'm not trying to be anti-China, but I'm seeing now what I saw at Transocean. Transocean, when they got bigger, they went away from the operational expertise and the captains and started going into the drill, and they started hiring Harvard guys, right, to who were management processes and all these things, and they forgot the we need to get the ship on location and get the drill bit running without killing anyone. And the Navy has forgotten about that. So I've been very focused on the Navy and especially my European viewers are like, John, what are you doing here? But I see the same lessons from the deep water horizon. Well, there are mines and anti-ship missiles and China's, giving military training to their hundreds of thousands of mariners, like, and we're not focused on, no one's talking to the captain. So that's, that's why my focus is now. And so I have a real, we, we kind of learned that offshore, but you know, it's, 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 it's like the Dutch kid with the, <laughs> with the dams. Every time we, we find some plug a hole, another one pops up, right? That's so true. I, I don't know if that answered your question. No, 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 no. But it's interesting because it's a good segue because I, I did some research, of course, and, and you're quoted here saying that we avoid disagreement and debates about the uncomfortable truths in shipping. And I think one of the excellent jobs you do is sort of put a spotlight on things that necessarily doesn't get out there, doesn't get the attention because just picking up your last point now, there seems to be some big fundamental shifts going on in sort of who is in the control of the ocean, right? And that affects everybody because trading and shipping is a global industry. So it, it affects everyone, right? So just maybe adding on your first question, is this sort of one of the things that we're not good enough talking about and getting at least a debate about? Because it, one case could be like, okay, is US better than China, of course, but that's subjective, I guess. But it's just about having the debate and truly understanding how the new sort of world order could look from a naval perspective, of course. Yeah, commercial is important too. Um, you know, Biden just came out on Friday and said, blame the, the biggest shipping companies. And <laughs> said, uh, the president of the United States says, I want to punch you in the face. And, and he gave some wrong statistics. You know, so he's being fed wrong information and the, and the European shipping giants are being like, well, this guy's wrong. And they're trying to like attack him on the factual end, right? But what I've learned is a lot of this is emotional and a lot of it's listening. Um, no one of the ship owners have come. We have DOT, the maritime administration, you know, the CEO of MERS, the, the CEO of uh, TGM, CMA, these guys have not come and talked to the maritime administration. See, we, we have this thing, we have this agreement after World War II, and the United States basically said, we're going to protect all the world's oceans, and we're going to protect against Russia and China, um, and we're going to open up our markets for you, so you can come in, and we're not going to charge anything for it. Uh, the only thing you have to do is you have to do all your denominations in the dollar, uh, so we can control and monitor But, I mean, that's, look at our biggest enemies, Japan and and, and Germany became these super powerhouses and that people who accepted this offer first. But being the police of the world, it's, you know, one of the thing, hypocrisy is a, is a core asset of people. Um, so if no one wants the police to run the commercial operations and be making money at the same time. So the United States like systematically disabled uh, through, through various mechanisms, its maritime industry and let it atrophy on purpose. 
uh, but retained a lot of the power. You know, the biggest flags of convenience, the top three, Panama, Liberia, and Marshall Islands are in North America on, uh, you know, American or former American soil. You have America was number 10 for finance. Now it's number two. You have huge investments in our competitor freight waves raised $90 million. So that's pulling the editorial and the news and the influence from, uh, you know, trade winds and Lloyd's list, Europe into the United States. So you have this huge influence growing. And she captain too has some frustrations with this and European ship owners, why are, you, why are you letting your ships be stuck in Mariupol and Odessa? So this is almost brewing aggravation and it can easily be solved if the ship owners came here and listened, but their American merchant marine has been so dead for so long. They're like, it's almost a joke. Like, why would we go over there? Like what, what use is it? To, why, why would we go over there and listen to you? You have no shipping companies. You, but you failed, right? But it was almost a systematic. So if you don't go and visit someone, if you don't go on their shores and meet with them, of course that's gonna open, you know, when there's a politician, you know, you have all these billions of dollars of lobbyists and everything else, but also personal relationships. You know, everyone's attacking the FMC. Well, they haven't mapped out the influence of the American political network. The FMC is an independent body. Biden does not get his facts from the FMC. He gets it from the Maritime Administration. What, so why is Biden picking on you? Why is he going with this false information? Why? It's because when I went back to that, what's leadership? It's listening. It's meeting in with their crew empathetically, and it's core institutional knowledge. The CEO of MERS does not have the core institutional knowledge of the American political maritime system or the Navy system or the defense. And it's not all good, right? We, we have major problems with defense contractors and overspending and failures in Afghanistan. But they're not listening before it got to the presidential level. They weren't listening to MARAD, and they weren't empathizing with the American situation, right? And they kept pouring their money into like most of the big, I won't say who, but major organizations in Europe media all have passes to the IMO in London and they get these invites to talk at the major Ponsidonia conferences. You know, and Americans are kind of, I'm not saying we're not treated nicely, but if we're almost an afterthought. Right. Um, so you have you have that, but we're also an afterthought in our own Navy. So the Merchant Marine, again, no captains in the Pentagon and think tanks and everything else. So there's a very small contingent that now has number one in finance, number one control of IMO through flags of convenience, number growing media, G captain freight waves and you know, Silicon Valley tech is enormous. Flexport's a multi-billion dollar company. So you got all this power struggle and thing, and the Europeans aren't listening to us, and it's starting to explode. And even after Biden, I mean, literally the president said, I want to punch you in the face, Marsh. I want to punch you in the face. There's no reaction to shipping. He's like, he's got his numbers wrong. And they're not understanding. You know, I, I think your previous guest, uh, Barstow, I, I love him and I think, and he did the right thing. We wrote a little bit of critical piece, but I think he was doing the ethically right thing. He, he, he was, and I like him and I'd like to meet him and we weren't going against him in Fredrickson, but it's a little tone deaf to America who's putting all this money into the Ukraine and the American public doesn't understand why these shipping companies are still going in there, these Greek shippers, and that information is not getting to the New York Times, so it's not getting to Biden. And the average American thinks that these big companies have had a free lunch with this protection all the years. So it's, it's about to explode, and that's why I'm focusing on it, right? But I think the solution is to work together. We, we write these articles to wake up and I'm hoping Fredrickson will wake up and come visit. I'm hoping Merce will wake up and, and maybe it's foolish on my part, but uh, you know, we gotta, we gotta work together on this because the world's getting more dangerous, right? And the Navy doesn't have the ships to protect commercial shipping. They're getting attacked in Iran and, 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 and by pirates again, and all these problems we thought we solved, they're blowing up. No, it's, it's a great summary. And I mean, dialogue is always a good idea, I guess. But just looking 
at the U.S. perspective, if you had the opportunity to join government in U.S. and just looking at the maritime policy, what would be sort of your top picks to just like, I want to execute on ABC because there seems to be so much negativity in sort of the U.S. like role, but there has to be something U.S. can do to really, you know, get back to basic or to reinvent something new. But just looking at the policy, what would you actually implement if you had the chance to be in the government and have the budget and say that, okay, I want to do these projects. It's, it's leadership. Like I said, you know, listening, empathy, and, and that technical expertise. So right now the U S maritime administration is run by a one-star Navy admiral who's never been on a commercial ship. So they're not going to, even if first comes and talks to them, but you know, why there's enormous power with these carriers. They don't understand you know, the enormous political power. Um, there's an enormous power in maritime and no one's using it and they're kind of letting. So first thing is, you know, we need we need ship captains at the maritime administration in the Department of Energy, in the Department of Commerce. Um, we need Europeans to come over here and open offices in Washington and then not just, not just to leverage a political power and do it the old way with lobbyists, but to actually roll up their sleeves. Like I would love to see the CEO of one of these companies, not just here, but in the IMO. Like everyone's, oh, the IMO is broken. They can't get through this. Well, um, you know, have you sat down in the IMO? Uh, you know, if I could get John Fredrickson to sit down in the IMO and roll up his sleeve and attend a working group and then go to Marad. Um, do it there and then understand who are the experts. So everything's kind of military centric and the, and the, the huge support for the Navy amongst the American public. And the Navy has a huge need for the merchant Marine, but they're not connecting those dots. So bridging those gaps. I mean, you never see a tanker captain at a bulk conference. You never see a bulk captain at a, at a cruise ship conference. You never see a cruise ship captain at a Navy conference. You never see a Navy captain at a Wall Street finance conference. Um, each year, I try to learn a different segment of the industry so I can help tie these together. But we've siloed, you know, everything's siloed, but we have to bring it together. And that can only come from you know, I can write articles and get people angry and get mad or, or upset or try to do the emotional, but it's going to have to come from the guys who have the influence and the money, uh, uh, you know, the CEOs of, of these companies and rock stars um, uh, of, the, of the European, because we don't have that in the U.S., right? No, definitely, definitely. I think you're probably going to get me in trouble for publishing some of it. <laughs> Because it's an emotional topic. And it, the other thing is it sounds really arrogant, like from an American. Well, you your your maritime industry has failed, John. <laughs> it took you 15 years to build what freight waves is building in a couple of months. <laughs> it raised 90 million for. You know, your failure in Afghanistan over 20 years, all these admirals who are telling us what to do were the guys who you know failed in Afghanistan. So so what do you know? And I think Americans also have to be humble and realize we don't have the answers. You know, no one has the answers. It's bringing the community together and understanding who has the influence, who has those levers that can be pulled to make ships safe. Because that's at the end of the day, I'm doing this because I don't want to see those cargo ships in the Black Sea hitting mines. I don't want... The Atlantic just said 40 million people are facing famine because we can't get grain ships out of the Ukraine. Like, forget everything else. The CEOs of all these companies and come and meet with Marat and the Navy and NATO and, and figure out that, right? And no one's doing it because the Navy kind of says, oh, that's commercial. The commercial guy goes, that's Navy. And no one's picking up the ball. No, it's, uh, it's, it's actually... Uh... A great summary and also a good ending. I think we'll end there, John. It was a pleasure and it was a big honor to have you on. So thank you so much for taking the time. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I love your show and I wish I had time uh, to ask you some questions because I, I have a million of them and I hope everyone goes back and listens to these other episodes. They're, they're, they're phenomenal. I've, I've learned a lot. And talk about de-siloing the industry. I mean, they, they're from, the, from the fish farming to the bulkers to the tagger guys i mean you're really covering a lot i think it's a big service to the industry and uh, i want to thank you 
and and the, and the useful energy is just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.